it's a little after it's a little after noon here in in Washington D.C. Um, 9 a.m. in uh, the state of Washington. Um, if there are any of you who haven't met me yet, I'm Jim Finkel. I'm one of the co-founders of the Atrocity Prevention Study Group and the organizer of our monthly meetings. I want to welcome all of you to today's discussion of neuroscience and mass violence. I anticipate that this will be an especially interesting meeting. I want to note that we will be recording today's presentations with our panelists' permission and that we will later be posting that recording on the Stimson Center's APSG page. We will not be recording any of the Q&A. Um, I'd like to remind everyone as we get started that all of our discussion will be unclassified. During the Q&A part of our meeting, we'll be operating under Chatham House rules. You may take notes, but you sh should not refer to individuals by name. <coughs> Some of you may have noted that we've added a list of recent books and articles that we think might be of interest to our uh, invitation and registration form. I will ask that if you come across books and articles in the future that you would like um, me to flag, um, please let me know. I want to turn now to introducing our presenter and commentator, Tim Phillips and Professor Heidi Raven. Tim is the founder and CEO of the NGO Beyond Conflict. Since 1992, he's led Beyond Conflict's efforts to help catalyze the peace and reconciliation processes in several nations, including Northern Ireland, El Salvador, Kosovo, and South Africa. He has also advised the United Nations, the US Department of State, Council of Europe, he was educated at Suffolk University and the London School of Economics and was awarded an honorary doctor of humane letters from Suffolk University in 2018. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Beyond Conflict, I invite you to look at their website. I have told Tim that if I were starting my career over and looking to join an organization, Beyond Conflict is one of the places that I'd be really interested in. Um, Heidi, who is no stranger to APSG, is a professor at Hamilton College, where she specializes in the philosophy of the 17th century Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza. She was the first philosopher to propose that Spinoza anticipated central discoveries in the neuroscience of the emotions. Heidi has published widely on Spinoza's philosophic thought on a 12th century philosopher Moses uh, Maimonides on free will and the new brain sciences and on Jewish ethics. In 2004, she received an unsolicited $500,000 grant from the Ford Foundation to write a book, Rethinking Ethics. That book, The Self Beyond Itself, an alternative history of ethics, the new brain sciences and the myth of free will was published by New Press in May 2013. So welcome to both of you, and thank you again for joining us this morning. I have a couple of additional housekeeping comments. Ilhan Dahir, my colleague at the Stimson Center, will be running today's Zoom call. Ilhan will keep everyone but the person presenting muted. We will hold all questions until our presenters have finished their presentations facilitate discussion. I will ask those participants using the video Zoom link to signal me using the raise hand function when they'd like to raise a question or comment. I will take questions and comments in the order that I see you. Please state your name after I call on you and which of our speakers you would like to address your question or comment to. For those of you just using the Zoom link audio, please use the chat feature to raise questions or comments. Ilhan will share the questions in the order that they are received. Finally, uh, for those of you who are interested, we are making available Zoom's closed captioning capability. However, each of you will have to activate it individually using the icon at the bottom of your screen. And with that, uh, Tim, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, Heidi. Um, I'm excited to, to, have, to meet you, at least by Zoom, and 
to really dig into your book, which I just um, learned about uh, through Jim in the last week or two. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. So I think Ilan's going to help me with my slides um, because I'm of the Luddite school of slide control. Um, so maybe if we can go to the sort of first slide, if that's okay. Sorry, I'm having a problem as well on my end. Give me one moment. Okay. And maybe while uh, we're waiting for that first slide, because I, I remember the opening slide is, um, Jim, you gave a bit of a background on Beyond Conflict. So this year is the 30th anniversary of Beyond Conflict. Um, for many years, we had a different name. And when I described the name, you'll realize why we went to a simpler name. It was the Project on Justice and Times of Transition. And we were founded in 1992, really at the end of the Cold War, and starting in Central and Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union, um, as these really post-communist states were emerging from dictatorship. Um, and the question was, how do they deal with their past? How do the new leaders emerging from you know, decades of repression not only deal with their past, but how do they you know, develop a, a culture of democracy, a culture of agency? How do they deal with human rights violations? How do they deal with coll collaborators? And it really grew out of the having traveled to the region and met a lot of dissidents who are now in charge of a lot of these post-communist countries. And certainly didn't have training, but we're really getting a lot of support at that time, you know, appropriate support from the international community in terms of how do you write new democratic constitutions? How do you build new democratic institutions? And in many cases, how do you build market economies? And my curiosity, having traveled through the region and some experience in Central America in the 80s, was this issue of, but how do you deal with your past? Because unless you deal with that in a very thoughtful, helpful way, it may be really difficult to really inhabit these institutions uh, in, in a in meaningful way. And what I heard from a lot of these dissidents now uh, in many cases, new leaders, and not just in government or in parliament, but also in the media and civil society, is this is what they often among themselves talk about, um, you know, because they're struggling with this transition. In many cases, they never really expected to happen as it did. And so um, I had a very sort of, I guess, simple and in some ways naive idea that it would be really interesting for these new leaders to hear from people who themselves Thank you. And maybe, Ilan, if you just go to this, uh, when you have that set up, the second slide. Thank you. And, and just broaden a little bit. That'd be great. Um, and the notion was that wouldn't it be interesting to hear from others, leaders in other countries, and not just the elite at the sort of the, the, the grass tops, but at the grassroots, people who struggled with change in their own context, people who sought um, in Argentina and Chile to move from dictatorship to democracy, or what was happening in Spain after Franco or denazification in Germany. Again, this is 1991, 92, before we had a lot of the experiences we have today to look at around the world in the last 30 years. And the idea was a very simple one, and maybe seemingly naive at the time, that while there are um, a lot of unique characteristics of every country's experience, either coming out of dictatorship or coming out of conflict, at the end of the day, they respond to these as humans. They respond to fear, anger, trauma, uh, repression, or hopes for a better future as humans. And this is without knowing any of the brain and behavioral science. It struck me, and I'm sure many here, that there is to some large extent a shared human experience in the world, particularly living under these conditions. And so the notion was, let's bring together these new leaders with people from these other countries who never imagined change in their own country, went through a process of change, in some cases, transformation, and in many cases felt a moral responsibility to share it with others. And so 1992, got some funding, organized a conference at the Salzburg Seminar, which some of you may know in Austria. And we had everybody from Vaclav Havel, who was the former dissident, now leader of post-communist Czechoslovakia, to 150 leaders from many countries around the world, including the people who led the truth commissions in Chile and Argentina. We had Telford Taylor, the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg, 
And we had Adolfo Suarez, the first uh, prime minister of, Fran of Spain after Franco, and a whole range of other people, including, I think, how do you like this, Jürgen Habermas uh, came, uh, and Samuel Huntington, the political scientist. But what emerged from that conference, which I thought would be a one-off conference, was a demand that there is power in hearing from people who have been through this before. Um, and, and so we started organizing as an organization and you know, it was built on what we called the power of shared experience. This shared experience methodology, I often use the, uh, the analogy, it's like a big support group on wheels. What we do is we bring in people into settings um, and it's not an immediate, aha, yes, I get if you're in Northern Ireland, the value of learning and hearing from people in El Salvador or even South Africa at that time. Because when you live under conflict or repression for a long period of time, you think your situation is unique, that nobody can understand what you've been through. And what I've later learned, there are a lot of cognitive reasons why that happens to us as humans. And so through engagement and curated in such a way where people start seeing, wow, you know, we don't have a word for compromise in our language, the way maybe the Americans think of it as a give and take. We think of it as a loss. We think of it as capitulation. In fact, in Spanish, compromiso means a commitment, but not the sort of give and take. And we start seeing that people start seeing these similarities in really profound um, um, the, the benefit of that engagement. And so that early work uh, helped catalyze what became the field of transitional justice in the, in, in the sense of how do we deal with our past? What are the ways to think about dealing with the past? And there's a real need to sort of catalyze and conceptualize this, not just theoretically, but practically. And you know, the power of shared experience uh, was something we deployed and many others did. And then more in the last 10 years, we started working at the intersection of brain and behavioral science and conflict transformation. And that photo you see um, is a much younger me uh, standing next to Jovan uh, uh, Diviak, who is the Bosnian Serb general who defended a multi-ethnic Sarajevo or Bosnia during the war. And you see a woman named uh, Naomi Hassan from Israel, who was a deputy leader of the Knesset. The man on the right is Salvador Sanabria, who had been a guerrilla leader in El Salvador with the FMLN, uh, a British diplomat, and also Hanan Nashari from Palestine, and Sahara Kamal was there. And it was really powerful to see people, in the case of Salvador, they had just signed the peace agreement in El Salvador a year earlier. And walking, and not walking, but touring and meeting with communities in Bosnia, this is 1995, just, just after the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords, they said to themselves, they are not ready yet for true reconciliation. The, the wounds are too raw, too difficult. So I'll, I just want a movement maybe to the next slide, if you don't mind. So, you know, the question is, why did we start looking at science? Over the last 20 years, because our approach is based on the power of shared experience, in a sense, we're theory agnostic. Uh, it's not like here's a negotiation style or a mediation style. It's how do we look at a country that is trying to end a conflict, trying to come out of a conflict in the midst of a peace process, or in the case of South Africa, they've already had the negotiated transition, but how do we deal with our past? And yet with all the experience, and this is going back to the late 90s, early 2000s, we realized there are so many intractable conflicts still out there, so many peace agreements that remain fragile. And are there really durable peace agreements and why? And then subsequent to that, particularly in Western established democracies like the United States, the United Kingdom and elsewhere, we see deepening polarization, but particularly identity-based polarization. And we can see very clearly here, threats to democracy in ways that I don't think a lot of Americans really expected. And we've always asked the question, what are we missing? The question used to be when we'd go into a country like Northern Ireland or somewhere in Central America, the Balkans, what are the appropriate shared experiences that would help leaders at different levels in this particular country at this moment help them? Then we broaden that to say, what are we missing in terms of our understanding of the human experience? Why do so many conflicts remain intractable? Why are so many of them on this precipice of failure again? And I'll look at Northern Ireland right now as a, a place that we should be concerned about. And what is the central role of identity in all of these? 
Because when many people looked at Northern Ireland from the outset, and, and a lot of it was because of the media coverage, it was a religious conflict between Catholics and Protestants. And everybody in Northern Ireland would tell you it was really about identity um, and contested identities. And the Balkans and many other countries around the world, including here in the United States. And so what we started asking is, what can we learn uh, about the human experience? And where does that sit? It sits in brain and behavioral science. It sits in evolutionary biology and many other fields in social science that we need to sort of, um, you know, mine for these uh, greater understandings. So if we go to the next slide, please. So as a non-scientist, uh, as a lay person, um, I start with a course I was teaching at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy about 12 years ago. And the course was called Conflict Transformation in the 21st Century, the Human Dimension. And I called it the Human Dimension because not only it reflected the shared human experience approach, but when I read a lot of the sort of theories around conflict resolution, I thought, well, this was right. Well, that was wrong. That was wrong. Maybe that was right. Or this needs to be explored further. But what I really thought would be really interesting is to explore the human dimension of conflict and reconciliation. And so every other class would have a speaker commit. So one class, I don't know if you know who Jerry Adams is from Northern Ireland. He was a top IRA leader, though he'll never still today admit it. And he was head of Sinn Féin, uh, which just won the majority in the elections in Northern Ireland in the last few days. And a student asked him, how do you sit across the table from somebody you may have tried to kill? They may have tried to kill you or kill people very close to each other. And he paused and he said, you know, it's tough to make peace with a humiliated partner. And there was a retired neuroscientist sitting in the room. And this is a man who was in his mid seventies, but in the eighties had actually advised George Shultz, the secretary of state, one of the real pioneers of bringing brain and behavioral science into American statecraft. And after the class in which Jerry Adams spoke, he came up to me and he said, you know, there's a lot of brain science behind these themes of humiliation, empathy, fear, and identity. And I said, what do you mean the brain science? Because I understood from social psychology, what I observed, what I experienced as a human. And he said something so simple and profound. He said, speaking as, he was a neuroscientist, speaking as a scientist, we are not rational beings with emotions. In fact, we're just the opposite. We're emotionally based beings who can only think rationally when we feel that our identities, as we see ourselves, are understood and validated by others. And that really powerful statement just struck me in a human personal term and also my work is that people do need to feel understood as they see themselves. And objectively, he said, and we can all see this, is, and we can see it in our families, never mind in conflict uh, in society at large, is that people will describe their feelings or how they see a situation or themselves in a situation. And objectively, it's not true. But what the science shows us, that almost doesn't matter at that moment. It's how cognitively they see it in themselves in that situation. And he said, we need to focus on how we think, not what we think, because how we think is so deeply unconscious. In fact, many scientists will say that our ability to even think rationally depends on our unconscious, emotionally based brain. So the more as a lay person, who's asking the question, what are we missing about the human experience around issues of conflict and reconciliation writ large? And hearing from scientists who say, focus on how we think, not what we think, that we think in mental models of the world, like an internal GPS system that actually comes on between four and eight years of age, that our brains evolve to be predictive and not reactive. In fact, our brains are anatomically more efficient being predictive because we are all the descendants of people in, in the plains or the, 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 of East Africa and elsewhere who didn't pause and ask the question, is that a pride of lions? <laughs> because those who did literally didn't survive. So we are the descendants of people who learned and not just humans, every other living species has learned to predict their social environment, their physical environment and their social environment. And so we think of these mental models and they come online at a very early age. So there is that sort of cognitive framework that all humans are born with, but then it needs sort of data input from the particular social environment we're in. And we think in groups. We are, our brain wired for survival. 
And, you know, we're certainly not going to come into this earth without a mother and a father. And then we depend certainly on the mother for a long period of time. And then the family and the, the broader social group. So we've evolved to think in groups. And our brain, the next part is we think automatically in milliseconds. Absolutely in milliseconds. So the more I and my colleagues start looking at this and said, wow, you know, the Enlightenment got a lot of this stuff wrong. We are not these, you know, rational beings. And if you think of the Enlightenment as it emerged, it was looking to the emergence of science to show that we can move away from superstition, mythology, even religion, and, and, and really center our understanding of ourselves in the world through science. And, and, and that emotions are the stepchild. And in fact, science is actually showing us something profoundly different. So if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. So we created, and thankfully we raised some money, um, you know, for something that's pretty new, is we created this innovation lab within Beyond Conflict. And what we do is we bring science and practice, not only our own experience, but communities and others we work with, to issues of conflict and reconciliation and social change. And one of the key things is, you know, the current paradigms, you know, whether what we're taught in schools or curricula, what, you know, government agencies, funders often think about, is we don't focus on the building blocks of cognition and emotion that drive conflict or limit reconciliation. And what we try to do, not just within, we partner with community groups in our work, but also with major researchers and labs at Harvard, MIT, the University of Pennsylvania, the New School, NYU, and schools abroad, to say, how do we identify the key psychological and cognitive factors involved? So when we think of theories of change, we also bring in a science-informed design process. What are you trying to impact? And every organization or initiative says, well, raise awareness, change attitudes, but impact and change people's behavior in, let's say, a pro-social positive way. Well, here's what the science shows, that if you really want to change behavior, trying to convince and change hearts and minds doesn't often get you the behavioral outcome you want. Actually, norms have a bigger impact on behavior than trying to change attitudes or raise awareness. In fact, if you look practically in South Africa, a colleague, um, somebody I got to know, Rolf Meyer, who is the chief negotiator in the talks to end apartheid for F.W. de Klerk, describes that he went through a paradigm shift, that he came to realize that the system he lived in and defended and benefited from was morally corrupt and needed to end and played an instrumental role in that transition. Where F.W. de Klerk, even on his deathbed a few months ago, Rolf would say he had a pragmatic shift. Game was up. The situation was changing. How do we cut the best deal? And never really could fully uh, admit what Rolf said was the moral corruptness of apartheid. And yet the pragmatic shift of de Klerk was a key condition for the ending of apartheid. You know, did we need a paradigm shift? Did we need a conversion on the road to Damascus shift? And this is what's really interesting is looking at what we know about not only paradigm shifts, pragmatic shifts, but what role um, that his, his attitudes may have not changed, but his behavior did. And so, you know, it's really, I'm giving you an overview, important to really unpack these. And what we try to do in this innovation lab is work to develop tools, design interventions, and we do this sort of what we call a diagnose, design, and redefine process. Uh, next slide, Ilan, please. And I know time is coming. So I'll, I'll quickly mention, and then we can get into a conversation, some of the current programs, and each one of these applies a brain and behavioral science lens and framework, but also our own network of experience and access to communities, but also who we partner with. So the first one on democracy and social identity, um, and then we have a program on international peace building and trauma and violent conflict. So if we can go to the next slide. So under democracy and social identity, we released a report about a year and a half ago called America's Divided Mind understanding the psychology that divides us or, or yeah, that drives us apart. And we did it with a, with a team of colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, because as we saw happening over the last five to six years, there is not only deepening polarization, but it's identity-based deepening polarization. And what the researchers point out, when polarization becomes identity-based, then a whole range of unconscious psychological processes come online to drive us further apart. And just knowing that, I mean, as a non-scientist, it began to explain a lot of what we've seen in this country in the last several years. 
But what the team did is they looked at, okay, how do we unpack not only the psychology of this, but are there points of intervention? And when I mentioned earlier, our brains evolved to be predictive and not reactive. When we as a nation become more isolated from each other, we live in different geographic bubbles, we connect with different people who are much closer to our in-group, we watch different media, often different social media, and there are many ways that we're becoming isolated from each other in the United States. And so we're constantly having our information about the other reinforced in more isolated silos. And what we found, our colleagues doing this research, is that Democrats and Republicans overestimate by half how far they are away from the other side on issues like open borders and immigration, gun control and abortion. So when you would ask on a scale of zero to 100, a Democrat, where are you, for example, on the issue of open borders and immigration? You know, you'd have some strong opinions of a more open immigration system, but you had a lot of people sort of in the middle. When you'd ask a Republican the same thing, maybe more strict um, controls, but a lot of Republicans were in the middle. But when you'd ask a Democrat, so what do you think the Republicans are on this issue? They say, oh, they want the borders completely closed. You'd ask a Republican, where do you think the Democrats are? They want them completely open. And consistently in these national surveys on these issues, on big issues, we found, wow, they overestimate by half the gap between their positions. And then on issues of like and dislike, again, a scale of you know, one to 100 or zero to 100, how much do you think, how much do you like or dislike the other side? And then how much do you think they dislike you? Both sides overestimate by half. And then on dehumanization, because we've done a lot of work with our colleagues on understanding dehumanization as a psychological process. And, we can, and they come up with the blatant dehumanization index, which is a pretty blunt instrument, but dehumanization is a pretty blunt, blunt process and outcome, is looking at the ascent of man scale from early primates to humans. And you would ask people, where do you place this group? Democrats, Republicans, and we've seen this in 13 countries around the world, when asked where you place your own group, it's about 87%. Not fully human, because you know, well, they're not completely with it, you know, within our in-group. The same happened on the Republican side. When you'd ask where do you place the other side, it maybe slips down to the low 80s. But when you would ask a Democrat and Republican, how much you think the other side dehumanizes you, it's up near 50%. So if you think the other side in this country thinks you're not fully human, well, we have nothing in common. They are a threat to our very existence. And so what we found is, yes, polarization is becoming more identity-based and thus becoming more toxic, but it's also based on a lot of profound misperceptions between Americans across these divides on each other. And then the question is, how do you address that? And we did this report, which we can make available, it's on our website. And, and we also laid out recommendations, interventions, and we've done some work in that area. And I'll quickly go to, in our international peace building, we got some funding a few years ago from a donor. This is particularly, I think, salient to this group, is how do you really understand dehumanization? So about eight or nine years ago, we did a conference at MIT on dehumanization, because our researchers, you know, partners at MIT said there's some work in political science, some early work in brain and behavioral science, but not a lot has been really, you know, sort of mined and brought together. And we asked the question, how do we understand dehumanization, not only from a research point of view, but from a lived experience? So we had people coming in from different communities who have experienced it. But like, for example, the head of the Soros Foundation's Roma Initiative in Europe, who's a Roma, came in and talked about everything they in the EU and everybody else was doing to address dehumanization against the Roma. And so that conference led to an initiative called Decoding Dehumanization, where we did a lit review, and then we released this report and we did some workshops to say, what do we understand about the cognitive foundations of dehumanization and the different elements of it? I mean, if it can be animalistic, the worst elements, those people are vermin, they're rats, you can see it throughout conflicts, not just in the Second World War, even more recently. It could be mechanistic. Oh, like you see these, you know, you think of the Chinese military are often seen as these sort of people without agency, without sort of mental models of their own as a group that strips them of their humanity, or it can be objectifying. 
Misogyny is a form of, you know, objectifying dehumanization. It's to strip people of who they are and it creates moral disengagement. And I'm giving a way overview, um, but we have this initiative in Nigeria where we've been taking some of the findings and applying a brain and behavioral science lens, looking at television and radio interventions um, to see if we can not only reduce conflict, but increase warmth and willingness to engage. And then the third under the trauma and violent conflict is this field guide for barefoot psychology, which looked at um, grad of a colleague working at the Zatri refugee camp in, in Jordan with Syrian refugees and realized it was limited psychosocial support for people facing some profound traumas. And the question was, what can we bring in an accessible form to help people understand about themselves? And so this isn't new research. This is actually taking everything from yoga and breathing and meditation, but also telling a story written with our Syrian colleagues who we worked with and hired about their journey from Aleppo to Damascus during the war. And what were they experiencing? Suicidal thoughts, depression, violence within their family unit, and the feelings of shame, the feelings of, of victimhood. And what we found was when they learned about how the brain operates, it created in a sense, it was liberating to them, they said. It was empowering, it was, it was agency enabling to think, wait a minute, other human beings would feel the same way I'm feeling if they went through that? Yes, and this is why, this is how our brains work. We actually did a randomized control test with some um, researchers at the New School, and they found that going through the field guide and different manifestations, whether it be an app or a book or training and teaching, had a significant impact in reducing cortisol levels uh, and physiological measures, increasing uh, oxytocin and trust. So it actually has an impact on people's not only sense of belonging, but reducing their stresses and, and, and trauma in a sense. Um, and we're now you know, deploying this in Central America and even here in the United States. So I'll quickly go on because I'm way past the time. I mentioned uh, the America's Divided Mind Report um, and I'll just we'll go beyond that. The dehumanization, I mean, particularly for this group, um, you know, the perception of people as less than human is a key psychological process that has accompanied some of the worst atrocities in human history. And I mentioned scientists classified humanization in three subtypes, animalistic, mechanistic, and objectifying. And it leads to moral disengagement. In fact, I was watching this morning on the news, this video of these Russian soldiers shooting in their back two unarmed Ukrainian men. And they were talking about what is it in terms of how uh, the Putin government has described Ukrainians in such ways that would allow people to act in such ways, you know, really at atrocities. And it's moral disengagement. It's seeing them as not fully human. It's the language. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the, um, the threat that they represent. And there's evidence that, you know, and you can see it under brain scans, when people are morally disengaged from others, you know, it can lead to some pretty awful things. And by the way, one of the most powerful things I learned from a scientist in our initial conference, he said, is dehumanization, it's literally the way how we navigate our social environment. It's not just the worst in terms of atrocity, it's how we navigate homeless people around us. You know, if we were to literally stop and engage and think, what do I do with this homeless person I just encountered on my walk or that homeless person, the amount of energy it would require in our brain to then engage cognitively in the prefrontal cortex to think about what do I do here, there, and there. It's not like there's an endless supply of energy being, you know, deployed in the brain. There's no like control. There is in a sense, you know, in a sense, a control center that says, okay, more energy is going to this particular moment of cognitive engagement and we, de we decrease it over here, right? And so literally just to stop and think about what do I do with this particular homeless person who maybe is asking for food or money you know, to do that all the time, we just don't have the bandwidth to do it. So even at that level, we strip people of certain moral um, and, and responsibility and empathy to navigate our social world. And that's why really understanding dehumanization, even that we, ex we process fear in the brain differently than disgust. And knowing that, in the case of Nigeria, our initial research found that between Christians and Muslims in certain states, 
it wasn't that they were dehumanizing each other, but they feared each other. And knowing that led to a different set of interventions to reduce the fear. Because when it becomes de um, discussed, then it, it brings in regions of the brain that have to do with pathogen threat. And I use the example, and it's probably not a good example, but it's a good example. If you're on a plane, as I've been, and you're in an aisle seat, and there are people walking next to you, and it's cold and flu season or pandemic, and they sneeze, what is your immediate reaction? Your automatic reaction is you pull back and you want to push away because that's a pathogen threat to you. That is quite ancient in our species. But if somebody who is a bully to you from college or high school came on the plane, you put your head down, you look differently, you hope that person doesn't see you, that's a fear response. And if you're in a conflict situation saying, wait a minute, are we dealing with disgust? Because that can lead to you know absolute moral and disengagement and actually could lead to ethnic cleansing and genocide and other behaviors, or is it fear? And how do you unpack that and how do you design interventions around that? So quickly to the next one. I think I mentioned this, um, I definitely did. You know, um, it's, it's really a trauma-focused psychosocial program that uses storytelling, psychoeducation and self-care. And, um, and we're seeing significant uh, results. And then I'll move on to the next one. I think that I'll wrap it up there. This is, um, we can make available, you know, this research in terms of our descriptions of the programs, the RCT results, the policy brief for policymakers and practitioners is on our website, as well as um, the America's Divided My Report. So I've gone over, this is a given in, an overview, and I'm sure in the conversation with Heidi, uh, we can get into this more and happy to follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Heidi, um, you have the floor. Okay. Um, thank you very much. This is really fascinating. And your work is, is thrilling to me because uh, it dove, dovetails with some of mine and extends it in interesting ways and, of course, applies it. And I'm just a theoretician. Um, so it's really exciting to see it implemented, uh, seeing these uh, theoretical insights in, implemented. Um, your statement that we must focus on how we think on, and not on what we think um, captures my approach as well. When I began to outline to myself all the major points that I would introduce about mind brain to respond to your shared experience model, I discovered looking at your slides that your methodology was based on the same basic uh, points as mine. And I'll, um, I'll outline some of those points just to get them. Uh, I, you've really mentioned all of them, but I will uh, just bullet them. <clears throat> we think in cognitive frames. We think in groups and the group shapes the interpretation of situations. And the group is often the actor and the individual is secondary. Um, that's the major theme of my book, The Self Beyond Itself. Uh, another one that you mentioned and I'll mention again is that uh, scientists, neuroscientists, um, I don't know exactly how they come up with this number, but the number that they often throw around is that 98% of cognition, and that includes all kinds of beliefs, attitudes, presuppositions, thoughts, understandings are unconscious or implicit. Um, and that, that's very important because we're not aware of what, you know, of, of, of our own uh, implicit thinking or assumptions. <clears throat> I was also struck by a point um, quoted in Beyond Conflict podcasts and, I, and attributed there, I think, to Nelson Mandela, that the focus should be on the system rather than the individual actor. And I thought that was very, very interesting and important uh, because all people get very caught up in systems and they become the um, uh, unconsciously uh, embodying the system. And um, so the blame game is not helpful. And also we have to look at the system and think of them as caught up in it. And the other thing that's interesting about that too is that the system can change quickly at times and sometimes their thinking changes quickly uh, because the system has changed. And that's a surprising thing. Um, okay, 
Um, this is a profound point and expresses the underlying reality that systems, structures, institutions shape the individuals in them, their implicit beliefs and interpretations of situations, especially their attitudes and affects and their actions to a very large extent. Um, <clears throat> and I think, oh, and, and we can, um, well, I think I'll leave it there. I would also add some other points um, that you presuppose and actually have mentioned uh, just now, um, but I'll emphasize them again. And that is that cognition uh, is always affective, that is to say emotion laden and emotions are central uh, and are evolutionary, very um, ancient. Uh, Jak Panksepp has, has, has written about that in very extensive ways about the seven emotional, basic emotional systems. And we're not only talking about primates, we're talking about all mammals uh, have these basic emotional systems. And that he argues that that is where consciousness comes from. So that it is the most basic uh, um, mammalian, let's say, uh, way of confronting the world. Uh, emotions and affects trigger actions. And in the absence, in their absence, action is nearly impossible to, um, to undertake. And that's fascinating because we, you know, the entire philosophical tradition is about training your intellect, your reason, and then you're supposed to have an action that emerges from it. But it turns out that Damasio and others have really shown that in the absence of affect, of of having emotions and uh, feelings attached to your thinking, uh, you don't act. And people who had brain damage, uh, uh, who were rational, but no longer had the same kinds of affect, in fact, were only able to act. Uh, in addition, um, as you've mentioned, Tim, um, affect in society, in society is largely group affect. We think, you know, when I talk to my students, they often, say things like, well, I have this feeling or I have this belief and it's just me, but actually um, they reflect large, they reflect groups. And we're not as, we should be more aware of how uh, unconsciously we are um, articulating and feeling inside uh, groupy things, <laughs> what I call groupy things. And uh, another aspect of that brought up by, um, let's say, Vamik Vulcan and other people is that group affects tend to be much more primitive than individual, individuated affects, emotions. And the prob one of the problems with groups is the primitive nature of uh, group emotion. And, and, and um, well, of course, the influence of atrocity on that and how one intervenes to, um, alleviate some of the intensity and also the primitiveness of those emotions. Uh, and the reviving of group memory and the whole role of memory in that and the reviving of memory, something that Robert J. Lifton and Vamik Vulcan and Jeffrey Alexander at Yale have talked about. Another thing is the power of the current situation. One of the things that I was surprised on when I did research into this is that we think that people are trained in a certain way um, by their childhoods. And of course that's true, but it was surprising to me how much current situations can actually shape people's responses and people's norms. Um, it's kind of the emergence of norms in, um, in current situations and they become compartmentalized. So here we have a kind of, um, particular situation and one's norms that were in another situation, let's say taught you know, in your childhood, um, sometimes are relegated uh, to other settings and to earlier times. I mean, this is really the issue of how did, how did all those Germans in Nazi Germany suddenly you know, kill all those people? What happened and they have, weren't they educated? And um, we find that in the United States in the sense that when I bring up issues of this kind, people say, well, we have to change our schools. And of course we have to change our schools in some sense, but it, it, we also have to recognize how much situations, uh, uh, current situations uh, really um, transform one's uh, interpretation of the situation and the values uh, emergent from that. 
Uh, societies can be significantly by, uh, affected also by competition for status. This is a very interesting thing. And this, um, of course, happens in the animal world as well. And the status of com the stat the competition, uh, stat uh, competition for status, interestingly, is, you know, we think of that in these kind of um, social, Dar social Darwinism kind of way, uh, as individuals, but actually, it's often group status. The competitions are at the group level. Um, and the neurobiology of that status seeking competition has roots in the cortisol system. And interestingly enough, um, uh, Sapolsky has, has written about this and done studies, but I'm fascinated by the studies of Michael Marmot, uh, who wrote the status syndrome in England, in, in Britain. And what he uh, showed in his famous Whitehall studies, and then uh, they were duplicated and extended later, um, is, that, is that status correlated, uh, correlates with longevity. So people in a hierarchical system who are higher up in the system actually live, you know, not, not minimal years longer, many years longer. And this is a really important finding that we have to think about in a, in a deeper way, how to deal with. Another thing that I'm fascinated by your work, um, Tim, is that you, your work can be scaled up and, uh, and, you, are, and you have scaled it up uh, so that the usual kinds of interventions that I've seen primarily, and this is not my field, uh, in atrocity and conflict, they're often directed at individuals or very precise individuals, um, leaders, and then there's a hope that um, they will um, trickle down, that the empathy will trickle down the connections. And I've seen that in, for example, the work of Vamik Vulcan and Mark Gopin, and it's very wonderful work, but I wonder about the larger scale. And it seems to me that you have addressed that issue with shared, with a shared experience methodology that uses both factual and fictional stories to create empathy across boundaries, undo dehumanization and moral disengagements. And it seems to me that one of its strengths is that it can it has been and can be scale, scaled up through media to reach thousands and even millions of people through the radio, for example, in Nigeria. I understand that you did that. And that's really fascinating. Um, another extraordinary strength of SEM, it seems to me, is that it introduces pilot projects based on explicit hypotheses to test their effectiveness in on the ground. And then it reviews those projects in the light of those findings. And that's, that seems to me very exciting. One of the research studies, um, I, if I understand this correctly, revealed that face-to-face -face meetings between groups who are in conflict uh, may not be as effective at, may at times perhaps, not be as effective at reducing hostility as initially anticipated. And that's very interesting. I've certainly encountered that on the small scale in things like department meetings, or <laughs> that sometimes you get people together and things are worse. Um, so there are other kinds of interventions that are better. Um, we have seen interventions in American media, perhaps uh, more inadvertently, or at least, and with uh, not with the explicit aim of conflict reduction, that trans that has transformed the images of women's women and blacks and gays and others over the last few decades. Um, with the effect what, that when the video came out of systemic police brutality against especially black men, the response was the Black Lives Matter movement, which engaged and showed that there was among the American public at large and especially the younger generation, empathy across racial and other social boundaries as never before. And that was very exciting to me. I mean, someone who grew up in the 60s and um, this, this seemed like a profound change. And our world, when we looked at the media, you know, in the 60s, even in the 70s, uh, you know, was all, I, was all sort of white males, you know, it was the, not that Walter Cronkite wasn't wonderful, but that was the world. A media replete with all kinds of complexions and differences surely helped 
lead to that outcome from changes in the images of women we see on TV to queer eye for the straight guy and on and on and on. Um, and this reminds me of the, um, uh, of, of the research of Jeffrey C. Alexander at Yale, the sociologist. And he's written about how attitudes towards the Holocaust changed. And I find this fascinating. Uh, immediately after World War II, the Holocaust, in fact, it didn't even have a name yet, was just seen as one more German atrocity. Uh, and then later, it then there was a transitional period where it became a Jewish atrocity and just related to Jews. And then finally, uh, largely because of the vast dissemination of the story and movie image of Anne Frank and how that was sort of universalized, then the Holocaust became in the public imagination, a crime against humanity, which of course it has remained. Uh, and of course, uh, Raphael Lemkin has, and, and, and all kinds of other things. But that's very interesting how the group public perception of these things can go through transitions as a result of interventions in media. Uh, and we could be much more deliberate about those. Um, yet there is a certain inadvertentness about how the Holocaust became universal and how we surprisingly realized in the last couple of years that Black Lives Matter had become all our lives, that we could as Americans read all ourselves into Black lives. Uh, Tim shared experience stories instituted with self-conscious deliberateness, a process of rehumanization across communities in conflict through radio stories that reach millions in Nigeria. And here is where I would like to make a suggestion of my own. And I'm just gonna um, take a little time to do that uh, and stop me if I'm getting too long. And that is that I have an idea for another way of doing that besides stories. And that is um, a project or a, a book I'm writing um, about, about um, reviving, remaking American civil religion. By that, I mean ceremonies, um, uh, 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 symbolic objects, actions, songs, um, pilgrimages, I mean, um, marches on Washington, all of these things we could acknowledge more as, um, as, as part of civil religion and think about how to use it much more deliberately and intervene in it to support democracy, science, and um, scientific, so, uh, um, or social scientific and scientific um, uh, solutions to problems, and uh, democracy by re-inspiring American holidays, traditions, and memorials. So I just want to read just a, um, a quote from Lincoln actually about this from 1838. In 1838 in his address on the perpetuation, he was very young then, of our political institutions um, to the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield, Illinois, a young Lincoln called for a, a revitalization of patriotic sentiment and reverence towards the value of the American founders. And he wrote, I mean, he spoke, we find ourselves under the government of a system of political institutions conducing more essentially to the ends of civil and religious liberty than any of which the history of former times tells us. They are a legacy bequeathed us by a once hardy, brave and patriotic, but now lamented and departed race of ancestors. Theirs was the task and nobly they performed it to possess themselves and through themselves us. Sorry. of this goodly land and to uprear upon its hills and its valleys, a political edifice of liberty and equal rights. Let reverence be for the laws, be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools and seminaries and in colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books and in almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit proclaimed in legislative halls and enforced in courts of justice. And in short, let it become the politics, the political religion of the nation. 
and let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay of all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. That's Lincoln. And I'll end with just a quote from Robert Bella, Robert N. Bella, uh, a century later. A century and a half later, and almost exactly 100 years after the Civil War, the sociologist Robert N. Bella voiced similar concerns. Bringing in, bringing the issue of American ceremonies, traditions, and ideals to public consciousness and concern in 1967, Bella put forth a clarion call bemoaning what he regarded as, quote, the substitution in an effort to demythologize the political system of a technical rational model of politics for a religious moral one, one thus exacerbating tendencies that I think are at the heart of the problem. At this point, Bella coined the term American civil religion to refer to traditions, political values, ceremonies, and holidays of the nation. Civil religion was a term coined by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century and refers to the central public ideals, values, symbols, stories, rituals, and ceremonies of a nation, memorials, monuments, um, and not, not to establish churches and doctrine, doctrines. We have to clarify that. It need not refer to God nor to religious texts. Bella, quote, conceived of the central tradition of the American civil religion, not as a form of national self-worship, but as the subordination of the nation to ethical principles that transcend it in terms of which it should be judged, unquote. He was ever wary that nations could use religious language and symbols as a means of self-idolatry. Self, civil religion, he pointed out, has not always been invoked in favor of worthy causes. Yet since the words and acts of the founding fathers, especially the first few presidents, shaped the form and tone of the civil religion as it has been maintained ever since. I'm not so sure about that. Um, and we also in America have a second civil religion, uh, um, uh, the religion of the, um, of, 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 the, uh, of, of the South in, uh, in the Civil War. Um, uh, the religion of the lost cause, which is highly problematic. Bella insisted that it can all, also be renewed to bolster America's best self and role in the world. So my project comes out of that. And I'm writing a book, uh, my book, Democracy, Science and Ceremony, Reinspiring American Holidays, Traditions and Memorials is a multidisciplinary analysis and argument for engaging in revitalizing American ceremonies and traditions to promote widespread public support for democracy, pluralism, and scientific solutions to social, national, and international uh, problems. Uh, my first uh, part of that project is to call for a national celebration of voting. And um, I published a, uh, with Mark Gopin, uh, published, we published together, um, a an op-ed uh, on that. Um, Eddie, I, I think we need to leave some time for for questions. So if you can, that, that's a good place to stop. So um, if it's all right with everyone, I, I actually want to uh, use the prerogative of the chair to to ask the first question, um, and I want to see if we can take some of this and uh, look at some of the current situation in, in Ukraine. I mean, obviously there is a lot of fighting still ahead, um, but I also think we need to be thinking to the future and thinking to, to the peace. And, and so my question to both of you um, is, uh, what thinking might you have, have done already about how you would take some of this stuff um, and apply it. Uh, Tim focused, for example, on the, the issue of humiliation. Um, clearly there are going to have to be, there's gonna to have to be reconciliation in various areas between Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, what can we take from all of this that we can, um, practically uh, apply as we start to think about these things. 
Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll go first. Um, I'm glad, Jim, you asked a really easy initial question. Um, I mean, it's very clear what's happening in Ukraine is atrocious on every level you can imagine uh, in terms of the violence, the invasion, the behavior, the dehumanization, not only of Ukrainians, but of Russians by their leader. Um, so there's a real, um, it, it's dehumanizing. Certainly there's language that dehumanizes. Ironically, the Ukrainians, I mean, it shows you how our brains or our minds can work in ways that are very, um, uh, what's the word, unhealthy to our species in that particular context. So one of the arguments that Putin makes is that Ukraine is central to sort of Russian identity. And yet he's willing to destroy Ukraine, at least an identity he thinks is competitive to his version of a Ukrainian uh, contribution to Russian national identity. Um, and it's very clear that in all the analysis, research interviews, that um, you know Putin's of a generation of a particular training that felt a deep sense of loss with the end of the, the Cold War and the Soviet Union and was unmoored. Um, and it's clear if you go back all the way, not only to 2007 and his Munich Security Conference, but even before that in the 90s, I mean, it was clear that he talked about humiliation and grievance and loss. And when you become leader of a major country with nuclear weapons, we need to pay attention to that. And I really wonder if successive US governments paid attention enough to that, not to say that we should hold off, but it should shape how we engage um, with the leadership of a country that has access to more nuclear weapons than the United States does. And, you know, we look back in history, during the Second World War, the War Department, long before the Defense Department, you know, reached out to scholars on both Germany and Japan to understand eventually we expect to win. How do we reconstitute those countries in a more democratic way, but also how do we anchor in their history and identity and what, in the case of Japan, what level of dehumanization, what level of the narrative construction led Japan to dehumanize the rest of Asia long before the attack on on, Japan, on, on Pearl Harbor. So, you know, it's not like it's never happened before, but we've lost that sort of track, right? Is to really understand the cultures, the history and the psychology. Now, psychology has advanced quite a bit <laughs> in the last 50 or 60 years, particularly brain and behavioral science. Um, but, you know, it's difficult because of the violence that is happening and the destruction of human lives. And I mean, I think it's important to recognize in Ukraine, it's, it was a deeply divided country before the invasion. Mm -hmm. And look how they came together to defend themselves across profound divides that were existing before the invasion. And one thing we know from both practice and research in, in social psychology is one way to deal with polarization is through cooperation. When, you know, that has a long history, right? You know, we're not going to get out of this particular, particular problem unless we work together. And in that working together, you do build some knowledge of each other. I mean, so you can see it in the context of what's happening in Ukraine right now. But even in the context of South Africa, when the African National Congress and the, and the Declare government began the process in 1990, 91 of getting to know each other and negotiating, they realized that they didn't know each other. Um, they had profound you know, fear of the other side, but they also realized they had profound challenges in the process of whatever that transition would look like. 30,000 South Africans died between 1990 and 94, more than the previous 30 years of political violence in South Africa. So both sides realized we need to figure a way together to address this. So they created this process. And in the process, they literally got to know each other. So they had a shared problem and they found a way to cooperate out of necessity. So to your question, that what I would, and it's difficult, but I, I think we need to think in stages. And I'm not talking about, you know, the military facts on the ground or negotiation, but at some point, Russia and Ukraine have to find a way 
to survive next to each other. So what are these sort of, for lack of a better word, psychological stages to prepare the ground for that? And what does that mean within Ukraine? What does that mean within Russia? And what does that mean in terms of how beyond Putin and Zelensky, how the Ukrainian people and the Russian people, um, you know, find ways to live next to each other? And one of the deep concerns I have is because Putin has so isolated the majority of the Russian people from what's really going on in Ukraine that the economic losses they're suffering from and the increased human toll, you know, is in the way the government is playing this and spinning this is a we creating not we just us, but are the conditions being created in Russia for a deep sense of humiliation and grievance that happened in Germany after World War I that found expression of confidence in rearming yeah. and not seeing this happen again. So as Finland likely joins NATO and Sweden, I think we just not need to do a conflict analysis only or a landscape analysis. I think we have to do an emotional psychological landscape analysis and ask what can we learn from decades of experience, many people on this call, and to lay the ground for the future and the short and medium term, because otherwise, you know, this only just creates the conditions um, for a Russia in the future. And the last thing I'll say is I remember when we did work in the Balkans with uh, Kosovar Albanians, I tried to remind them, but it didn't quite land on receptive ears among Kosovar Albanian leaders that if you're a Serb living in Serbia, you're, think of Putin, your whole mental model of what was normal had collapsed. So Yugoslavia collapsed and Serbia was at the center. Then, you know, they lost in a sense, it's not maybe the right word, but in, in Bosnia. And now Kosovo, which in their narrative, going back to the 14th century played a key role is being lost. I said to the Kosovo Albanians, I, I know it may be difficult, but think of where you are compared to Serbia. They see loss and decline, and you're seeing the opportunity to have independence for the first time in a thousand, two thousand years as, as Kosovo Albanians. And if you could hold on to that, it's about expansion, and the other side is dealing with contraction. <laughs> and is there any way to be empathetic to what that might feel like? It's difficult when you've been the victim of war and suffering and trauma and loss. But this is where I think leaders, even outside of that setting, can help. And this is where Mandela used to be very helpful, or other leaders, to say, not if I, if I can do it, you can do it, not that blunt, but create a, a different narrative of what it is to be a victim or to be a victor. Heidi, do you have any thoughts? Um, the only thing I, I would pick up on is um, the issue of uh, cultural identity and and political identity and um, how can a cultural identity, I mean, Russia is extremely rich culturally, how can something, you know, rather than identity being coming out of humiliation, how can other things in the cultural identity of Russians be valorized uh, to help with the humiliation uh, to, um, uh, but, but not the most negative effects of uh, feeling victimized and humiliated as a result of the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, how can other things uh, become more central to their identity and valorized in the context of political relations with Ukraine and the world? So at this point, Ilhan, I'm going to ask you to turn off the recording and we'll go to Q and A's from the 